Amen. Y'all can just remain standing. You know, Sheila, I just really never quite know when these songs are over. I'm just kind of like, I think, no, not yet, not yet. Amen. She says we'll worship him forever. It's all right. Well, amen. Hey, why don't you turn and greet someone and thank them for coming to worship the Lord this morning. Just encourage their hearts. being joined in worship by our other campuses and uh, we're all excited to get into God's word together this is week number eight in our series uh, 10 choices to change your life forever and uh, hey kind of came a little casual today did you notice yeah. and the reason I came casual today is because sometimes I'm walking in the church lobby and, and on my day off or something and people are like wow look at you to which I always want to get, yeah, well, look at you. <laughs> and I know what people are saying, well, I never saw you when you weren't all dressed up before. Well, this is, this is the real me. And I, I want to talk to you today about uh, the gap that sometimes occurs between uh, who we are and who we appear to be and how important it is to close that gap. Uh, the next uh, uh, priority choice, choice number eight, is, is I choose to be authentic. I choose to be authentic. There has to be something inside us that ha hates fake stuff. Hey, you want to know what I hate? You don't wanna, want to know what I hate? Ask me. I hate fake stuff, man. I hate fake stuff. This is from my house, and uh, I don't like to criticize my wife, man, but sometimes she puts out this, this, this stuff in bowls. All right, help me out here. Which one of these is the real one? Okay, is, it, is it the apple or is it the pear? There seems to be no consensus here. I'm just telling you, I get confused. This is real. This, I come home, I can't tell you how many times I picked this up and then, yeah, no. It's, it's so deceptive. It's just, it's fake. I hate fake stuff. I got my son uh, landing here in this service, and I don't mean to uh, be especially critical of him, but he's always trying to get me to watch those science fiction. I hate science fiction, man. It's fake. And, and I can't tell you how many times he's tried to get me to watch the Star Wars movies. Ten minutes into it, I'm like, <laughs> It's fake, man. Darth Vader, forget that guy. It's fake. And, and uh, sorry if that offends you. And, and I just, I've never really, really ever had a much interest. I hate pro wrestling, man. Yeah. That is so fake. Yeah. Okay? So the guy gets up in the corner on the ring. He does the back flip, lands on the guy's neck. And then 10 minutes later, that guy's up pinning him. I don't think so. That is so fake and I hate fake grass. I want to watch football on real turf, man. And I, I, don't, I, and I hate when I'm watching a comedy or something on television, and you know it's not very funny because they got to put in that fake laugh track, and you hear all these people going, <laughs> I'm like, that ain't funny, man, or they wouldn't have to put that fake thing in there. And, and I just hate fake stuff. What do I hate? I hope you do too. You know, because we're in good company. Do you know that God hates stuff that's fake? I mean, he really does. And not surfacey, silly things that I'm having fun with you about. I mean, God, God hates the soul fakeness. God hates the gap in my life between what I know to be true and, and where I'm really at, what I'm living. And if we're going to go after something, if we're going to make a choice about something, here's an incredible choice that we can make. I choose to be authentic I choose to be genuine. I choose to be sincere. I choose to be who I really am. Let's go for that, all right? Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6, and uh, let's start with this thought. This will help you. I cannot please everyone. I mean, I just can't please everyone. That's part of the problem. Why it's hard to be authentic, because I'm just trying to please everyone. I get, I'm like a juggler, and I get everyone's expectations up in the air, and then more is added, and then more is added, and it always comes crashing down around my feet. And, and, and the expectations of others are so in opposition to be an authentic person. And the uh, context here is the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6. And uh, Jesus is directing his message primarily to the Pharisees, which were the kind of the Bible thumpers of their day. And uh, they took the Bible very seriously. They confronted error. They were separated from the world. 
Of course, the problem was in Matthew 15, 8. Jesus said, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. So that's the context when he kind of looks right into their eyes, Matthew 6, 1, and says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who's in heaven. Beware of practicing your righteousness. There he doesn't mean um, uh, the righteousness in the sense of how Paul talked about it. Paul talked about your righteousness as you're standing before God. He said in Romans 3.10, There's none righteous, no, not one. Uh, but here, when Jesus uses the term righteousness, he's not talking about your standing before God. He's talking about your practical righteousness. He's talking about the righteous deeds that you do as a believer. He's talking about reading your Bible and praying. He's talking about uh, sharing your faith, going to church, uh, being in a small group, serving the Lord, uh, giving to the poor, uh, your acts of righteousness, the things that you do that reflect the reality of your heart before God. That's what he's talking about when he says, beware the word beware there, pay attention, be on guard. It's like, boop, 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 warning, warning. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people. You're like, I, I find that kind of challenging because how am I going to be the person God wants me to be? And what am I supposed to get out of my basement so nobody can see me? And, and, and then I'd have to go out of the world. No, he's not talking about that. Notice, he's not saying that you should get into a monastery. Some people have thought that. It's not that. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people see the issue as motive. Look at the text. In order to be seen by them. It's not that you should do it so much so that they won't see you. It's so that you need to make sure that because they will see you, that you don't let their seeing of you become your motive for doing it. Okay? Sitting in the front is great. If it's to be attentive and to get the most possible out of the message that you can get and you're comfortable sitting here. But if you would do that to be seen by... See, do you see what I'm saying? It's, 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 not, it's not the wrongness, is not the visibleness. The wrongness is the motive that's driving that. Okay? That's the key. Look at the text again. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. You gotta be, you're kidding me. That's right, no reward. If all you're doing is coming to church and carrying your Bible and being a Christian so people can see you, so they'll pat you on the back, so they'll applaud you, so they're like, man, you are, wow, wow. What, and all God's people said, wow. if you're like, wow, I just, then, then God's like, well, you know what, you, you, that's your reward then. That's what you were going for, you got it. You think that's so great? Have that, if that's what you're going for. But we're, we're to be living for a higher reward, for a reward from the Lord. Now, I know when I talk about rewards, some, some people are like, oh, James, I, I don't want any rewards from Jesus. I don't need any. I love him so much, he doesn't have to give me a doggone thing. Not a thing. Not a thing. I don't want a thing from him. You think that's spiritual? Because the scriptures are filled with the motivation of rewards. And if God himself says that it's okay to be motivated by rewards, then it's okay. I want the rewards, all right? Let me just step out there on a limb and just say, I flat out want them, okay? And, and y'all can give me yours too if you want to, okay? <laughs> I want the rewards. Look at, look at what the scripture says. Matthew 5, 12 says, Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. Matthew 5, 46 says, For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? If you just love the people that are easy to love, you're not getting a reward for that. Matthew 6, 38 says, Give and it will be given to you. If you're a generous person, you're going to be rewarded for that. 1 Corinthians 3, 14 says, if the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. In 2 Timothy 5, 2, pardon me, 2 Corinthians 5, 10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. I want to get what's coming to me. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 and 8, I finished the race, I've kept the faith, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord will award me or reward me on that day. And uh, 1 Peter 5, 4, when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Revelation 2, 10, Jesus said, be faithful unto death and I'll give you the crown of life. Revelation 22, 12, behold, I'm coming soon, bringing my reward with me to repay everyone. I want the rewards. Do you want the rewards? 
Okay, I flat out want him. And what, he, what he's saying is, is that if your thing is for other people to pat you on the back and applaud you and say, what a great job you're doing, boy," If that's what you're going for, that's all you're going to get. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then uh, you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you uh, give to the needy, sound no, sound no trumpet. So, if you're going to give, if you have something you're... Just imagine that we're in church, and it's the offering plate's coming down the aisle, and uh, it kind of gets to this place right here, and the offering plate's right in front of me, and then I'm like... <laughs> like this. Look at me. Look at me. Look how much I'm giving. Not great. Not great. And that's why even when we take the offerings, we do it in rows. We don't put it at the back door where everyone can watch. No one really can see. Just a couple of people beside you. Hopefully some people you know. And, and in a bag, not in an open plate. No one can really see what's in there when it goes in. And, and then you all count the offering. We don't count the offering. It's people, just members of our church, uh, take turns counting the offering. And, and uh, only, I think, one or two people who work or even know. And it's all locked on a computer record. No one could even get to it if they want to. I have no idea what you give. I mean, I have no idea. I've never seen it. It's never occurred to me. Uh, it's between you and God. And, and we're trying to set up a system so that you can have the joy of knowing no one's going to thank me, no one's going to appreciate me, no one's going to treat me special because I'm so generous. God sees it. God's keeping track. God will reward me or not for what I've done. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may be praised by others. He says, truly I say to you, they have their reward. The word truly there is like, amen. They, get, they, ha they have what they were going for. But when you give to the needy, oh, look at this. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Like, well, that's going to be kind of hard because, because I, my hands, they mostly work together, you know? When I'm typing and, and when I'm uh, um, lifting things and when I'm playing the piano, my hands are kind of on the same program. And, and so the idea is, of course, of course, of course your hands know what your hand, The point is, is that um, to be so careful about not parading what you do, it's, it's, it's hyperbole. It's like leaving one part of you wouldn't even know. Now, by the way, some people have taken that to mean, well, I'm going to give what I'm going to give. I'm not even going to tell my spouse. Uh, incorrect. First of all, you and your spouse are one. That was a great spot for an Amen. I give you guys these great chances. First of all, you and your spouse are one. Amen. Amen. All right, so, so you're on the same program anyway. The, the point is, isn't to divide your household. The point is, is to not have a divided heart. The point is, is to not be doing it for praise from men and for God or something like that. It's just such a... You say, why, why, is, why is hypocrisy so prevalent? Here's why hypocrisy is so prevalent in the church. Here's why hypocrisy is something that's hounding you and me. Because I have these uh, torn, divided uh, desires. I have what God wants, and I have what I want. Read Romans 7 and see as Paul was battling it. I have what God wants, but I have what I want. And then to complicate matters, I really want you to think that I'm more about what God wants than about what I want. So you're not making it any easier for me. i got the own battle going on inside me. I want to be about what God wants, but what about what I want? And, and, but but then, I, then I, I don't want you to think that I'm all about what I want. I, I want you to think that I'm all about what God wants. And I want to be all about what God wants. And uh, it gets really, really complicated. I grew up in a church. I think I've shared this with you. Good church, good people. Found the Lord there. One of the things that was really a battle in my church, though, was it was really externally focused. I remember the day that I found out that a man in our church <gasps> smoked. Yeah, I think that smoking, like anything, is an addictive thing. I think it's not healthy. I, I, don't, I wouldn't commend that to anyone. But somehow that external thing, that one thing, was the most awful thing. And, 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 and what, what about other sin? What about all the other sin, you know? And I, in my church, it was like the filthy five, you know? We don't do these five things. Yeah, what about all the things you do do you're not supposed to do? And what about all the things you're supposed to do you don't do? And, and I just remember growing up with such a sense of scrutiny. I want, to, I want to show you a little illustration of this. It's very personal, and you'll think it's funny, but it isn't at the end. Back, back in the uh, mid-1980s, did you know that I went on a game show? Did you know that? 
I did. I was on the $25,000 pyramid in, in the, with Dick Clark in the mid-1980s. Want to see a little clip of it? All right, here it is. This is James McDonald. James, they tell me uh, you're not our usual run-of-the-mill contestant. What is your line of work? Well, I am a minister to single adults at Arlington Heights Evangelical Free Church. I am a part-time student at Trinity Divinity School in Deerfield, originally from London, Ontario, Canada. How do you have time enough to play the pyramid? I mean, Well, I have my wife videotape and I watch it in a spare moment. There you go. All right, you can practice there and come here and win the money. We... I didn't win any money, but... <laughs> <laughs> But, but here's, here's the thing, and I could show you the clip of this, but I won't because it's so embarrassing to me, and for years my family teased me about it, but it'll give you a little insight into what, and you probably know what I mean when you feel the scrutiny. As I was playing the game, I had to, you know how it goes, you try to get the person to say a word, and you say a word, and you try to get them to say the word, and the word that I had to try to get the uh, person from, you know, the other person on the game show, the movie star, whatever you call them, the word I had to try to get them to say was um, the word revolution. Well, if I'd been brought up in the United States, I would have said, you know, the American, the war would have given the date, and, which I can't even think of right now, and and because I would have all that American history. I didn't have that. So the only thing I could think of, and you're under the pressure of the moment, you know, when the real you comes out. And so the only thing I could think of was that Beatles song that has the word revolution in it. I said, you know that Beatles song you say, you wanna na 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 And the person didn't get it. So we had to move on. That's not the thing. At the end of the thing, when we were done that little section, Dick Clark looks at me, a pastor, in 1987, and he says, oh, so we have a real Beatles fan here, huh? And I gave first my genuine response, I went, and then right in the moment, I thought, all the things went rushing through my mind of all the people watching this show and all the people seeing me say that I was a real Beatles fan and da 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 And I went like this. I went, yeah. Nah. <laughs> and to me, it's such a portrait of what I was struggling with, of what we struggle with, about what it feels like to be a person who wants to be genuine, who wants to be sincere, who wants to be authentic, but the immense pressure of other people to conform, to meet their expectations, to look the part, to not, do, not have anything about you that anyone could criticize. It's an awful, awful way to live. And I'm dreaming a better dream for our church than that. Where, where petty, silly things about which the Bible does not even explicitly speak, but about which Christians so often have such strong opinions can separate us and pressure one another into some kind of external conformity that doesn't reflect our heart and doesn't please or satisfy God. So if we're going to be authentic, let's start with that. I cannot please everyone. I just can't. Of course, I preached a whole message on this from 1 Corinthians uh, chapter uh, 2 that where Paul says, to me it is a small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court, but he who judges me is the Lord. Therefore judge nothing before the time, for the time will come to light when the Lord will uh, bring out the hidden things of darkness. Then each one's praise will come from God. And every time that uh, teaching, I, uh, freedom from people pleasing, goes on the radio, I mean, you just, people just call in, I have to have that. It's where a lot of us have lived our lives trying to please other people, trying to meet their expectations. It leads to hypocrisy. I cannot please everyone. Now notice from Matthew 6, 16, just across the page, jot this second thing down. I gotta tell you the truth. God despises hypocrisy. I mean, it would be hard for me to even frame language that could clarify for us how incredibly God hates hypocrisy. And notice with me, uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 16, he says, and when you fast, you know what fasting is? It's like, um, it's like uh, willingly, uh, voluntary abstinence from food to heighten uh, spiritual desire. That's what it is. And some people, when I'm going through a difficult season, I abstain from food to heighten spiritual desire. Voluntary abstinence from food to heighten spiritual desire. And so when he's, uh, the Pharisees did it sometimes even as much as once a week, they were very devout. Fasting's used 70 times in Scripture. Here it says, And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. So here they've been fasting all week, and, and it was supposedly for God, but then they come to church, and they're singing like, I love you, Lord. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> and they're, they're like, kind of like grimacing in pain. And do, do you see me over here? Do you know why I'm in pain? Do you know why? Because I've been fasting all week, okay? That's how much I love God. How's it going for you? 
You know, that's what's going through their mind. You know, do you see me over here? Because I am so spiritual. I don't know if y'all have figured this out, you know. And, and he's, Jesus is like, God's so not into that. When you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, where they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. He's like, you know what? Amen, truly, amen. They have the reward. Is that what you're going for? Is what you're going for? The people to pat you on the back and say how spiritual you are? You know what? Great, you got that now. Truly, I say to you, they have the reward. When you fast, it's an illustration, of course, of all spiritual things. When, when, you, when, you, when you do your righteousness, when you seek to serve God, anoint your head and wash your face. In other words, take a, have a shower, clean up a little bit. So people are like, wow, you look like you had the most amazing week. You've been living on easy street. And God will know the truth about the way that you've been seeking him with your whole heart. No one will know. God will know. And, and, and notice the promise. When you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who's in secret, oh, pardon me, but uh, by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. God will reward you. God knows what you do. God, God sees all of those things. You don't need to, well, I don't know if anyone really appreciates me. I don't know if anyone really sees what I do. I don't know if anyone really comprehends all the kind of effort that I'm putting in. God knows. A better plan is to hide your service from other people's eyes. God will see it. God will reward you. Yes, he will. You're like, James, I, I kind of have a hard time believing that just because I struggle with not being appreciated by other people, that God's going to keep my reward from me? I mean, maybe he'll be disappointed with me. But I mean, I mean, is it really that big of a deal, this little bit of hypocrisy? Well, here's what I want to do. Um, why don't you turn your Bible for a minute over to, keep your finger there, and turn over to Matthew 23. And I want to show you a passage of Scripture that if you've never seen it before, this, is a pas this passage of Scripture is written to church people. This passage of scripture is for people like you and me who, who work hard at doing right things but can over time, if we're not careful, be guilty of doing the right things outwardly but our heart's not where it needs to be. And uh, I want to just play a portion of scripture. You can listen to the audio and uh, observe this portrayal of uh, Matthew 23. Uh, let's just watch it together. And you pick up Jesus' heart about hypocrisy. He's talking to the Pharisees. He's talking to the churchgoers. He's talking to the Bible people. teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Right from verse 13. You shut the kingdom of heaven in men's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert. And when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as you are. Woe to you, blind guides! You say if anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his oath. You blind fools! Which is greater, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? You also say, if anyone swears by the altar, it means nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift on it, he is bound by his oath. You blind men, which is greater? The gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? Therefore, he who swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. And he who swears by the temple swears by it and by the one who dwells in it. And he who swears by heaven swears by God's throne and by the one who sits on it. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices mint, dill, and cumin, 
but you have neglected the more important matters of the law. Justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides! You strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee! First clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside also will be clean. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous. But on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You build tombs for the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. And you say, if we had lived in the days of our forefathers, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. So you testify against yourselves that you are the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of the sin of your forefathers. You snakes! You brood of vipers! How will you escape being condemned to hell? Therefore, I am sending you prophets and wise men and teachers. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Others you will flog in your synagogues and pursue from town to town. And so, upon you will come all the righteous blood that has been shed on earth. From the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. I tell you the truth. All this will come upon this generation. You know, it's um, shared with you in that format to help you get a sense of the immense intensity with which God hates the hypocrisy in us. And God forbid that we would watch something like that and think to ourselves, you know, boy, they really, or she really, or I was, he was here, or, you know, um, but to look inside at ourselves. A couple of really key themes that are coming out in that passage. One of them is inside, outside. What's outside, what's inside. What's outside, what people see, what's really inside me. And, and, and that that needs to be a closing gap over the course of my life. But see, hypocrisy is the kind of thing that starts off as a crease, then it becomes a crack, and if neglected, it becomes a canyon in me. The difference between what I say and do and what I really am inside. And so Jesus is going over there. Inside, you're like this. Outside, you're like this. But inside, but, but, but outside, that, that needs to be narrowing. I need to be more and more the same inside and outside, not with a greater, greater a difference. So that theme's in Matthew 23, inside, outside. Another theme that's there uh, that's very hard to miss, verse 4, verse 15, 
or pardon me, uh, verse 16, 17, 19, 24, and 26, all say, uh, blind, you're blind, you're blind. Now, you, you'd, ne you'd never slap a person for being blind, right? And, and uh, so, so to accept the fact, look up here, I don't even have the capacity to discern the degree to which this is true of me. I can't even see this about myself. So your sense right now in this moment of how much you do or don't need this challenge is completely lost on you. I'd like to suggest that this is a far greater issue in each one of us than we are even capable of discovering on our own. That's why we come to church, because we need a messenger to hold up the mirror of God's word and say, this is a problem. This is a problem. And it's not, not a problem because you don't sense it is. You need someone else to speak into your life. You need someone else to tell you. You need someone who knows you and loves you and cares about you to say, hey, you might want to give some thought to the growing gap between what you profess and what you practice. What people see, but what God knows you are. See? And um, it's very serious. Very serious. Hypocrisy is what we want to leave behind. If we don't give great attention to it, the gap only grows. I mentioned already the church that Kathy and I grew up in, and uh, it comes up again in this illustration of the most amazing family from another church like ours in the city I grew up in. There was five or six kind of like-minded churches, you know? And there was this one family in another church called the Bucks Bombs. They, they were so kind and rich. Oh my goodness. These people were so rich. Uh, it said in the newspaper that he, he had this, uh, tw this was in the mid 80s, he had a 28 million dollar chain of nursing homes uh, that he owned. A guy came in the 1950s, came to uh, Canada with just the shoes on his feet and a few cents in his pocket. He had worked so hard and these people loved God. So much so that every youth group in our whole city would go over to their house. I'll never forget the first time I went over to the Bucks Bombs house and I went in and, and saw they had this indoor swimming pool and this arcade. And I'm like, I had never seen anything like this in my life before. I mean, I just couldn't believe. But the thing that was awesome was how generous they were and how kind they were. And so we'd go over with our youth group multiple times. In fact, uh, even when I was in college, I remember uh, one particular year that after the basketball season was over, our whole basketball team went over there for a big year-end party and everything. And, and, and the Bucks Bombs just very, very generous people. The summer after Kathy and I were married, I was working at, uh, at an assembly plant trying to make ends meet before uh, we could go into full-time ministry, and I was working at the Ford uh, uh, assembly plant uh, near my house, and I was uh, actually putting uh, car doors uh, on Crown Victoria, so if yours is a little messed up, if you have one of those, uh, sorry. But it was 10-hour shifts, night shift, not, a, not, not, a, not an easy job, I'll tell you that. Working in an assembly context, a lot of hard work. Some of you who do that, you have my highest respect. It's hard work. And I'll never forget the night that I walked into the cafeteria and was heartbroken. One of the, a couple of the men were sitting at a table. It was over lunch, and, and they were reading the newspaper, front page of the newspaper, that uh, Helmuth Buxbaum's wife, Hannah, had been murdered. And uh, he and she were driving home from picking up their nephew at the airport, and just like they would, they had stopped by the side of the road to help some people. And one of the gunmen had come, one of the men had come back when they were trying to help them and decided to rob them, pulled Mrs. Buxbaum out of the car by her hair, put three bullets into her head. I mean, just a tragedy. And, and uh, I just said, oh, this is awful. I know these people. They're the most wonderful people. I can't believe this has happened. I'll never forget when one of the guys looked at me and said, I don't know what you're talking about. That guy's a cokehead. I said, you don't know who you're talking about. These are the sweetest, kindest Christian people. I, he said, are you kidding me? That guy goes to more prostitutes than, I mean, everybody knows that. What's wrong with you? And I said, you are wrong, man, and you need to stop saying that. Within three or four days, it all came out. He was everything that guy said he was and a lot more. And he paid someone $25,000. The whole thing was a setup. He stopped knowing what those men were there. The whole thing was a setup. Those two guys in the car there were paid uh, by him. And uh, he went to prison, of course, for it. And uh, he just died November the uh, 7th. That's why I can tell you the story. And uh, look at this picture. 
This is uh, his gravestone. And if you could see it, if it was blown up. Helmuth Buxbaum died November 2007 after spending the last 20 some years in prison, died in prison. And there he is buried beside the woman that he arranged to have murdered. I didn't see it. Hypocrisy. A canyon between what he appeared to be and what he was. And that didn't happen overnight. That happened over a long, long, long period of time. And I want you to know something about me. I am marked by that. I will never forget how sure I was and how wrong I was. It causes you to reflect upon yourself. I, I want to be authentic. I, I don't want to pose for anyone. I don't want to posture for anyone. I, I don't want to appear to be something that I'm not. And I don't want you to either. And I want our church to be a place where we can come and be real and honest. I mean, think about how many chances that guy had to say, I'm struggling. I'm not what you think I am. Someone help me. And every time he took a pass, he wanted what he wanted. He wanted to look one way. He has his reward. And he wanted to have what he wanted to have. Now, that is on a collision course with disaster. And uh, I was thinking about it and just praying about it this week for my own life. And I wrote this little prayer. This is for me, but I'll just share it with you. I just called it, I want to be real. I want to be real. I don't want to force it or fake it or fix it after the fact. I just want to be real. I want to operate from truth, not from pressure to please or perform for people. I don't want to choose from fear of what others will think of me or of my motives. I want to choose what I know is right because it's good and because it pleases the Lord. Help me, God. I want to be real. I have the information mostly. I know I'm supposed to read and pray and I know about worship too. I know I'm supposed to witness and work for the kingdom and I know about loving others more than myself. Oh yeah, I know all the stuff. I know nearly everything I'm supposed to know and most of all, I know that knowing is not enough because it doesn't displace the denial in my heart. Help me, God. I want to be real. By real, I mean ready, filled with anticipation when I arrive at your house to worship you. Heartfelt worship. Yeah, that's real. By real, I mean ready with thanks for the cascade of blessings raining down upon my head in this and every moment. Genuine gratitude. Yeah, that's real. By real, I mean an easy choice of obedience to silence my demanding flesh, which calls me to choose what you lovingly forbid. Obedient holiness. Yeah, that's real. By real, I mean ready to be generous to people in need. Not hoarding or hiding or helping out of guilt. Yeah, giving freely and continuously. That's real for sure. Help me, God. I want to be real. This is a choice that will change your life forever. Jot it down. I choose to be authentic. I choose to be authentic. I don't want to pose. I don't want to posture. I don't need a pat on the head or a slap on the back. I'm not looking for applause. I choose to be authentic. Come back with me as we head toward the Lord's table. Come back with me to Matthew 7. I choose to be authentic. Let me give you a fuller definition of this important word. Authentic. Jot these thoughts down. Genuine. As in, not forced. I'm not doing what I'm doing because my wife makes me come here. I'm not, I'm not saying what I'm saying because it will upset my kids if I don't. Now, no one's forcing me. I want this for myself. Got it? I want it. I'm not doing it because I'm being forced. Not forced, not coerced. Force is obvious. Force is like, stand up, all right? That's force. Uh, co coercion is more where you're leaning in and pressuring subtly a person. You're not coming right out and making them do it, but there's that constant kind of, you better do this, there could be some problems if you don't. I don't want my faith to be like that. I don't want to be here this week ministering God's word to you because if I don't show up, people are going, what do you do all week? I want to be here because I love God and because I love you. It's not forced. It's not coerced. 
And worst of all, it's not contrived. I'm not in the right place saying and doing the right things because that's what's expected of me. It's, it's, I'm not acting. And I'm speaking for all of us here. Don't you, don't you want to be doing the real thing? I mean, take off the mask and do it because you really feel it and you're really into it. Authentic, genuine, not forced, not coerced, not contrived. Flowing from what is true, based in fact, sincere, without pretense, without performance, real. All in favor of authenticity? What a great church. To, that if we could be authentic, authentic. I'm, I'm telling you, the world is dying for places that are the real deal. God help us. I choose to be authentic. Here's three things that'll help with that right from the mouth of our Lord. Here's the first one. By not judging others. Notice that it says in Matthew 7, 1, judge not that you be not judged. Now I gotta tell you, that's the most misquoted text practically in the New Testament. People are always like just slapping that on everything. Oh, you can't judge. Don't judge. Far, you know, not supposed to judge. Hey, I don't know if you know this, but we're not supposed to judge. Okay. That, that's, first of all, that's not what that means, all right? It doesn't mean a categoric blanket dismissal of all things judging. Let's look down at verse 6 where he says, Don't give do uh, dogs what is holy. Don't throw your pearls before swine or pigs. The pearls there is talking about the precious teachings. Don't, Jesus said, I'm not going to keep teaching people who don't want to hear it. I'm not going to keep sharing with people who just slap it away. Well, doesn't that require a judgment? Don't you have to kind of form a judgment? It's not talking about don't judge actions. In 2 Corinthians 5, Paul called a guy out for being a, a serial adulterer. Okay, sexually immoral. I mean, you can judge actions. Parents, don't ever let your kids back you away from judging actions by saying, don't judge. We have to judge actions. The gift of discernment is a, is, a, is a spiritual gift. We have to judge actions. Here's what Jesus is talking about. Here's what we don't judge. Number one, we don't judge motives. Right? You don't know why people are doing what they're doing. Don't ever let yourself say, I know why she's like that. I know why he's doing that. No, you do not. Only God knows a person's heart. That's what we don't judge. Don't judge people's motives. Nothing is more painful than someone judging your motives. I know why they're doing that. Oh, do you? Do you really? Do you really think you fully understand? I bet you don't. God doesn't want us judging the territory that is his venue, all right? The, the judging of the heart, that's God's job. How many people think we should just let God do his job, all right? Go ahead, Lord. I, I don't get it. It's, not, it's too big a job for me. I don't even know my own heart, let alone other people's heart. So, don't judge people's motives. Here's the second thing it means. Don't judge appearance. Don't, don't judge appearance. Don't judge a person by the color of their skin or the clothes that they wear or, or the car that they drive or the place that they live or the job that they have. Don't judge people by what they look like. Okay? You can't tell a book by its cover. You can't. And, and, and God hates that. And, and God loves every person in this room. And, and when we form judgments about people based on how they look, or, or how they act, even if it's, if it's not an obvious sinful thing. God's like, why are you doing that? That's what don't judge means. Don't judge motives, don't judge appearance. And then this is really important, the third thing, don't judge. When you have to judge, because sometimes you do have to form judgments. Don't judge harshly. Don't judge harshly. Don't hold people to a standard that you're not keeping. All right? Don't judge harshly. Notice in Matthew 7. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. Yikes. So with the, with the judgment that I give to others, that's the judgment that I'm going to get. The judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you used, it will be measured to you. All right? So if you can't be pleased, if you can't be satisfied, if you can't be, and you're constantly judging, that's the program. God's going to be like, yeah, well, here's the script you were reading off. Let me just read off that script now for you for a minute. Not great. By not judging others. Here's the second thing. I choose to be authentic by not judging others, by judging myself. 
by judging myself. He says, why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but you don't notice the log that's in your own eye? That's like almost humorous. I'm sure that when Jesus said that, the people were like, <laughs> you know, they're just like, are you kidding? That's just a funny picture. It is. He's like, okay, so you got this guy, and you think he's got a problem, and you're like, you know, I think there's something there in your eye. I just can't quite get at it. Let me just see if I can get that out for you. It's just like, he's like, the idea is, is that the thing that's in your life is so big that it, it keeps you from getting close enough to see the thing that the other person needs to work on. And, and uh, look down at verse 3 there. See what it says? Why do you see the speck that's in your brother's eye, but you don't notice the log that's in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye. There's a log in your own eye. Hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye. Then you can see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. And when you've dealt with the big thing in your life and really been honest with God about it, how different will your tone be as you talk to someone else who needs to grow, huh? And when I'm dealing with my stuff, the whole way that I come and talk to you now, it's just going to be so different. Because I, I, know that I, don't, I know that I don't have it all together. So the way that I talk to you about what you need to work on, it's just going to be just a lot different part of being authentic, not judging others, and judging myself. It's time for us to judge ourselves. The scripture says it's time for judgment to begin in the house of God. The church of Jesus Christ is so judgmental of the world. How about judging ourselves? We're the ones that know God's standard. How's that going for you? I want to be authentic by not judging others, by judging myself. Verse 5 then, you hypocrite, take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. And jot that down, by pursuing authentic relationships. Nothing will help you be authentic more than spending time with authentic people. Try to avoid people, try to steer clear of religious, fake, phony, surfacy, gossipy, fault-finding people. Okay? People who want to be like that, people who are determined to be like that, people who don't want to change. We've got to try to help them, but we don't have to spend a ton of time with them and make them our best friends. Spend time with people who are sincere and genuine and love God and build relationships with people like that, and they'll inspire you to the same. All right? I'm going to ask those who are serving communion to come now, and we're just going to go right to the Lord's table. In just a moment, there's going to be trays coming up and down your row. One of them will have little pieces of bread in it. The bread represents the body of Christ broken for you. And then the other one is a cup. And the cup represents the blood of Christ shed for you. Now this remembrance is not for everyone here. Some of you here, you may not have given your life to Christ yet. God knows your heart, I don't know. But if you haven't given your life to Christ, when the tray comes, just pass it along. And, and spend some time just thinking and praying. Maybe this morning you could give your life to Christ. Maybe taking the bread and the cup could be your first act of faith to say, I believe. But after the trays have come back to the front of the church, if you do know the Lord, if you do love the Lord, if you believe that he died for your sins and rose from the dead to prove that he's God, make sure that you have these things, uh, a little piece of bread and the cup. Make sure you have them in your hands. And then in a moment, we'll receive it all together. All right? Don't worry about anyone else looking at you. No one's paying attention to whether you're holding it. We're thinking about ourselves. In fact, this would be a good time to kind of bow our heads in prayer and just look inside. Take some moments for self-examination. God loves you. Jesus died so that you could be forgiven and have the gift of eternal life. He's reaching out to you now. You could receive it by faith. He'll purify your heart. He'll change your life. Just listen as the worship team sings this prayer over us and you continue in prayer. Purify. 